Many people say South Africa doesn't deserve to be invited to the heads of state summit of the BRIC economies, not least because South Africa's economy is just one quarter of Russia's, and Russia's economy is the smallest of Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Sure, and if you look at it purely on a scale basis, you'd, you'd probably have to agree. Uh, we don't have the scale, we have a relatively small population and uh, within that population not only do we have to deal with issues of, of HIV AIDS but uh, it, it's actually a relatively small working population or, or rather an economically active population. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about a fairly uh, co constrained uh, size of the economy. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there are a lot of constraints to growth. Um, so our growth does not match up with uh, many of the other emerging markets. And, and so from that perspective, if you had to look at BRIC um, as it was defined by, by Jim O'Neill and, and looking specifically at scale, at growth, at things like urbanization, at, at all of those things that, that help promote growth, uh, you'd have to say that South Africa in and of itself as it stands right now is not a great choice for a BRIC country. Uh, but I think if you had to look at it slightly differently, now BRIC I look at just as an acronym. I don't really look at it in terms of anything more significant than that. Um, if you had to look at it uh, strategically speaking, mm -hmm. that's where I think South Africa scores quite highly. Because within the African continent as such, um, it doesn't have uh, a tremendous uh, infrastructure as you find in the likes of, of uh, Brazil, for example, mm -hmm. as one of the BRIC countries. Um, so you need a, a, a certain portion of, of the, of the uh, continent that you're investing in to be able to offer you uh, entrance into many of these markets right. through liquidity, uh, through the sophistication of those markets. Um, we know that, for example, huge amounts of, of FDI come into South Africa rather than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. It's not that they don't see the growth elsewhere, but sometimes the, the sophisticated markets just make it right. that much easier for South Africa. Bismarck, your turn in Nigeria's favor. Yes. They do meet a lot of the technical criteria to be uh, a so-called brick economy or emerging market yeah. economy. With a population of over 140 million people, you've got the critical mass, the eighth largest producer of crude oil, the world over a burgeoning middle class. Um, what are the chances of Nigeria being a G20 economy within the next 10 years? And that is a real possibility. <clears throat> uh, the whole thing now, Nigeria is a suboptimal economy, but it's a fast growing. In terms of nominal growth, Nigeria has achieved 7.8% this year. Uh, its uh, formal economy is about $300 billion. Uh, the population is there. Uh, the market is moving towards uh, from total imperfection towards some type of perfection. There's greater governance and greater transparency. There is a political transition taking place. Hopefully, a plural democracy will gain roots. Therefore, on a purely potential basis, mm. Nigeria st uh, stands a good chance. But in terms of its actual uh, ac accomplishments, it's still a suboptimal economy. So there's a lot of work to be done. It's a work in progress economy not a really imagined economy. Uh, Bismarck, to continue using your terms of Nigeria being a suboptimal economy, I mean, some of the countries that are referred to as the next 11 economies to watch after Brazil, Russia, India, and China are countries like Turkey, where the value of the economy is over $600 billion. You've got countries like Mexico, where the value of the economy is over $870 billion. South Korea at $833 billion. Nigeria is nowhere near there, and not least yes. because of infrastructure problems within the country and other social problems within the country. Uh, realistically, is Nigeria a little bit over ambitious about the 2020-20 vision? No. <clears throat> the truth is that if you were to address power alone, if you could imp increase power supply by one hour a day in Nigeria, you can get the economy up to 9% growth. Don't forget the growth figures you're talking about is the formal economy. The informal economy is another 33%. So in real terms, the Nigerian economy is about $400 billion. And I'm saying that if you can deal with road and power infrastructure, which you can actually deal with in another two to three years, you can actually make this economy much more substantial than it is. Mm -hmm. Now, the biggest problem the Nigerian economy faces is that of institution building and a manpower crisis because of the education problems. Mm -hmm. That is going to be a much more daunting problem that the country has mm -hmm. to deal with. But in terms of getting it optimal, uh, I think doing, dealing with power, road infrastructure and utilities and then harnessing the gas and uh, oil revenues and using it more efficiently and transparently could easily make Nigeria into uh, one of the next 11 uh, overshadowing Turkey or 
any of these other countries in a very short period. All right, uh, George, Bismarck raises the importance of infrastructure and institutions, and in South Africa's favor, that's what this country's got going for them. Good infrastructure, first world infrastructure, systems that work, a banking uh, system that's well oiled, in fact, <coughs> surpassing that of even countries like India and Russia, for instance, we're told. So, in terms of democratic credentials, in terms of infrastructure and facilities, South Africa gets an A. Plus. It does. And, and I think uh, a point to, to raise and, and potentially to debate a little bit later is, is the issue of. I look at South Africa and uh, I consider South Africa a capital scarce country and yet it's a lot easier to raise capital in a country like South Africa than it, than it sometimes is in, in a country like Nigeria. Uh, we yeah. also know that uh, in, in terms of building power stations, the cost of, of building a power station, not to mention the length of time it takes to implement uh, the, the construction of a power station, can sometimes take the better part of five years. Uh, so not only is the, are, there, are there huge uh, constraints that Nigeria faces in terms of, of the raising of the capital, but also uh, the skills and, and, and the necessary skills and application to be able to implement the construction of those, right. those power grids. But I don't disagree with, with what Bismarck's saying. I think uh, you, know, you, you get the power situation in Nigeria sorted mm -hmm. out. You would unleash mm -hmm. potentially growth, what probably in excess of 10% that could hit the double digits. It's to get to that point first. And unfortunately, as we've seen in South Africa, as your economy expands, so it places greater right. pressure on the electricity grid and you're constantly chasing your right. tail and you're doing it in a capital scarce environment, which, which obviously introduces right. a whole bunch of constraints. So my only concern about the 202020 vision is, is that it's maybe a little bit too soon. Right. Um, it may get there but maybe not as soon as the next okay, 10 before years. Before I ask Bismarck to comment, I mean, South Africa also has a few of its own limitations. Energy security, you're raising does. that yeah. issue yeah. right now. But we've also seen South African exports dwindle by 20% over the last few years. There's a skills yeah. problem in this country. There's a productivity problem in this country. And many people are questioning, if South Africa were to join the BRIC member states alliance economic grouping, what would the tangible trade benefits be for this country? Well, you see, I don't look at South Africa in terms of, of the African continent as such. As, as you point, as we've discussed, it's not a big market. It's not a market that's going to grow particularly quickly with the like HIV AIDS pandemic. Um, but what you do have is the potential for a strong services type sector uh, that, that potentially services the rest mm -hmm. of the African continent. So I don't look at it so much as a productive base, but mm -hmm. if you look at a country like the UK, for example, that had a tremendous banking system, mm -hmm. that banking system served a number of countries and, and in terms of trade facilitated right. the trade of services throughout Europe. Now you look at a South Africa and potentially it has the ability to, to conduct that sort of business uh, but from a productive base I, I think South Africa will probably struggle. Bismarck your comments on this one we're talking about productivity and boosting exports. Uh, South Africa's got some real uh, structural challenges in that respect but so does Nigeria. You're growing over seven percent at this moment. Um, um, is that sustainable given some of the shortcomings you've pointed out? No, it is sustainable because, again, <clears throat> it's a suboptimal economy and you are achieving 7%, driven mainly by oil and part of the non-oil economy. But I tell you that if you put the West African region into the game, well, because the regional integration has its own advantages for Nigeria, if you put that and the policies, are, the policies pursued are right, you will find that it's very easy. What happens is that if you, on, what you do is when you have this infrastructural base, you can actually leapfrog. Yes, how you are going to sustain that becomes another issue. But there are some basic industries, like look at the cement industry. Nigeria has gone from a net importer of cement to a point where in, in another year or so, they're going to be producing 20 million tons, going to be net exporters. Mm. That puts Nigeria in a in a very competitive mm. position in that industry. I look mean, at telecoms <coughs> and look at oil itself, look at gas and the gas master plan. If you take a few of these priority areas, maybe five or six of them, and then really drive them to the max, you'll find that the Nigerian economy can actually sustain a growth rate, maybe in double digits, especially if you have the power situation mm -hmm. resolved very quickly. Uh, Bismarck, you mentioned institutional deficits in Nigeria, and it's also something yes. that George has uh, referred to. <coughs> 
issues around the rule of law, issues around the regulation of key sectors like ICT, the petroleum industry reforms, um, security. I mean, we've watched um, the situation in the Niger Delta unfold. We've watched bombings at Independence Day. All those yeah. kinds of things start to affect investor perceptions about Nigeria. Are authorities serious about addressing these uh, serious issues? M most of my conclusions about Nigeria are based on one assumption that the political situation in the election in the next two months is going to be resolved amicably and efficiently. If that is done, then all the other matters are easy to handle. But if, it is, if you end up with a dysfunctional government and a dysfunctional system, then all the projections you are making are just a complete waste of time. So we have to be, we have to be optimistic and realistic at the same time that this is going to happen because the stakes are so high and that if you, if you get it wrong, what the, the value at risk is pretty high. But if you get it right, the benefits are going to be substantial, not only for Nigeria, but the entire region.